This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to a head-banging morning here in Medikwe in the northwest. Yeah, myself and Rihanna finally gotten out. Fortunately, had difficulty getting our car working this morning. But we are out and about, and we have a little bit of giraffe action for you. Now, it doesn't look like it's too serious. A little bit of practice, a little bit of fun and games. Giraffe doing some necking, hitting heads with each other in the early morning. Hello everybody, my name is Steve and I'm joined by Rihanna and Camera and we are very excited and delighted to finally be out with you this morning. I hope you're having a wonderful start to your week. So when I say it's not too serious, when the giraffe are serious the swinging of those necks can be incredibly powerful you can hear it like a huge hammer being slammed against the body and they aim for the body they aim for the head and I've seen giraffe knocking each other completely unconscious, possibly even dead. So some people will say that the giraffe's long neck actually has designed from its ability to fight. So initially one giraffe had a little bit longer neck than another and that made its ability to fight better and so those genetics were passed forward and eventually over eons of such competition the neck got longer and longer and longer you can see two groups of boys here attempting to do a bit of practice as anyone who has ever tried to do any form of boxing or fighting you know that it's impossible to step into the ring and be competitive without practice without sparring without practicing on a boxing uh, punching bag or at least with somebody else the skills required to fight like this take honing they take coordination swinging a big neck like that if you swing it uncontrolled without practice the chances of injuring yourself are quite high Christine, the standing side by side enables them to be close. And if they didn't stand side by side like that, one could possibly dominate. It's almost like the particular strategy of doing this necking means that they need to be right next to each other, almost leaning on each other. If they didn't and they just came and swung their necks, it might almost lead to an unfair advantage. There's a huge pendulum that has to swing there. And if they weren't leaning against each other and they swung, see, even when they stand forward like this, they don't do very well standing like that. They often have to turn. And you'll always see giraffes repositioning themselves to put their mass against each other, putting their bums against each other to sort of get the space. There's a very particular space that's required. Otherwise, they'll be too far apart or too close together. And 
I've never seen giraffe fighting in another fashion. You might see them standing front to front like the ones at the back there, but then you don't see real competition happening. Those are younger ones there that are just learning the ropes of locking the neck. But as with any martial art, there's a particular stance, a particular type of fashion uh, that makes you more successful. It allows you to ground your legs. You can see how all four legs are very grounded there and the weight of the body. So the giraffe tries to knock the other giraffe over. So by having their full weight in one position, they aim the swing for either the body or the top of the head, under the chin, and it can sound incredibly powerful. The bigger and older the male, the more developed he is on the forehead. You can see these two guys here are starting to develop those calcifications or knobs on the forehead. As they get bigger and older, those become more pronounced, making the hammer-like end of the neck, the head part, heavier and more powerful. And they use the ossicones. They try and use the ossicones as the point of contact when they swing. It takes years of competition and practice before they are quite ready to compete for the females. Beautiful morning light. Sorry about the radio. Steph, we've been thoroughly enjoying our giraffe action on Madikwe as well and really enjoy the amount of giraffe we see, how many giraffe we've seen lying down and I have no doubt at some point we will see a physical confrontation between evenly matched boys. You can see that those two there on the left are very unevenly matched. The one on the left is much bigger and so he's just giving him a, a bit of a rundown. Very gentle tap. You see what happens if we stand front to front? I'm going to hit you in the lung and that's not going to be very good for you. So let me show you. There we go. On the leg, they will sometimes aim for the legs and physically knock the other one over. And that seems to be the defining moment in a giraffe competition. There we go. Let me show you how to stand, young gentlemen. This is how you stand to fight. And push. And pull. And push.
sounds like it's something relating to the jackal's feeding behavior. I would love to answer that. Ha, ha, ha. Amanda, there we go. What hunting strategies do jackals use? Right, Amanda, it's arguably one of the most diverse predators around in the mammalian group, in the mammal group, in terms of strategy as well as food that they that they consume. Right, remember I mentioned the jackal being a smaller predator and the cutoff is usually, we divide them in several groups from a feeding perspective. So usually those smaller than about 20 kilograms fall in this broad category uh, that they have to eat a lot of food compared to the larger predator. So that, just keep that in mind. Secondly, in order to sustain the energy needs, they cannot only focus on one particular prey animal having such high metabolic needs. Right, so therefore jackals will target a variety of species. So there lies the answer to your question. So they cannot have one particular hunting strategy because they need to catch birds. They eat, I've seen them eat lizards. I've seen them eat alates, termites erupting after rain, licking them up from the ground. They, I've seen them eat carrion. They're very efficient scavengers. So there's a good strategy is to use their nose and sense of smell. They often some of the first ones to detect lion kills or predator kills, the same as hyenas. But the advantage is there that they very smaller, sort of very quick animals, and often we'll see them at a carcass where lions are feeding, and they often will quickly dart in and take little scraps that might have fallen, or maybe rip off a quick piece of, of meat before the lion can react. And um, so that's a strategy that's that's that's, that's unique to jackals. Uh, so they do scavenge quite a lot as well. They are very efficient hunters of birds and rodents. I've seen a jackal once eat a monitor lizard. And they're also known to eat fruits. Include some fruits in their diet. Most notably, the African ebony tree. Remember there at Juma, we've got those beautiful big African ebony trees. And remember the alternative name for the African ebony tree is the jackalberry, referring to the jackal's habit to consume the fruits of that tree. We found the two lions. One has just actually sat down, which is great news. So I think if I go around the corner, I thought they were going to actually dip down into the drainage line, which is why we were looking. But let me go forward. No, no. Yes. There's a little gap here. Can you see him? It's not the greatest view, but they did get up and move when we spotted them. And like I can say, I mean, I don't drive particularly fast at all, so I won't park on top of them. But we are, we, it's not like we're far away from them at all. Anyway, so here are at least two of the individuals that have been leaving tracks and roaring throughout the night. But I am going to need your help to, of course, to identify them. But we've got three potentials. Are they individuals from, well, sub from the Kambula Pride? Are they the Nkulu males? Or is it perhaps a black dam male? So we've got one with a smaller tattered mane, and this individual's got a big sort of chunk missing out of his right ear. And then the other male is far more attractive as lions go, shall we say. He, he, he seems to be not as battered and bruised. He's got a lovely big full mane. And if I'm not mistaken, with the, uh, with the, what are they called? The, the black dam males, of course, one has got a slightly larger mane than the other. I can't remember ever noticing tatty ears though, but to be fair, I only saw them once and they were miles away. They were probably about 80 meters away from me. I was sitting on the dam wall, a treehouse dam. And that was the first and last time that I saw those individuals. I have not seen the Kambula Sabarats sub before. I did see the pride last year in February when I was at Mala Mala on a private safari and then the Nkulu males which uh, come from the giraffe pride 
No? Are they from the giraffe pride? Well, I swapped that with the black dam. The black dam males are from the giraffe pride. So I'm still trying to figure this all out because I don't guide in the Sabi sand much anymore. So it's incredibly difficult to try and keep up with between them and lions of East Africa. I'm a bit more uh, versed in the lions of, of, of Kenya and uh, mainly Kenya and Tanzania, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, so let's see who who it is, who it's going to be. But I will wait for all of you. Uh, I think that that identifying feature is is quite obvious. But both both individuals do have some scratches and bite marks towards their their rumps, which obviously signifies that they have been fighting, whether it's fighting amongst themselves or potentially bumping into other male lions. It, it literally it could be either way because some of the coalitions that are coming in at the moment, like the Kambula sub adults and as well as the um, and Kulu males, they, you know, there's there's a couple of them. There are many, many, many individuals uh, within that within the coalition. So quite often for them to scrap amongst themselves too. Oh, okay. So apparently this is part of the black dam males. Very interesting. So now, of course, we need to try and and figure out then. Where on earth did the Kumbula sub-adults go then? Are they still on Simbambili? Are they still around there? Because they apparently walked from Mala Mala and just south of our traverse, basically, and all the way towards the fence. So that's really interesting. Or was it perhaps a case of mistaken identity? Which, of course, happens. Uh, I mean, we need to also remember that people who have to be a little bit lenient with people because identifying animals is 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 a difficult thing and not everybody you know their um, priorities especially when you're you're guiding at lodges your priority is not exactly to know every single individual line you know hopefully be able to identify a couple of individuals within the pride so or, or coalition and that type of thing and it is really tricky at the moment with all the movement of of the males so it's it's quite possible that there could be some lost in translation it most certainly will come from me absolutely at the moment i'm like very inexperienced in the northern sabi sand uh, i haven't i haven't been here the last time i was here was a year and a half ago and it was only for i was here twice and it was for four days at a time so that really doesn't give you uh, you know much chance to really sort of to sort of settle in but it's it's exciting nonetheless though and and i for my new year's resolution i actually said that i am really excited for the change in lion dynamics and i hope that i'm here to witness some of it although it's not always very pretty it is necessary for the genetics um, of course new genetics to be constantly passing through and the development of new and old prides so there's a huge open space in the northern sabi sand at the moment with single male lions here and there however it's perfect for a large coalition of male lions the birminghams were the last ones um I remember there were five of them when they f when they first moved in from the birmingham pride so it's very interesting very interesting so i hope i hope that one of the bigger coalitions of male lines do decide to to settle around here whether it's going to be the black dams or the nkulu or even the um kambula's sub adults gosh for those of you who have just started watching you're probably like oh my goodness what are all these names you're talking about I hear you and I feel you. It's it's not easy. You can hear I'm stumbling over my words because it's not like I say those pride names or coalition names all the time. Let me see if I can try and get a bit of view. I, I want to maybe go around the corner just a little bit so you can see they're just sitting off the road at the moment. Uh, we are we're on Twin Dams Road. This road goes towards Treehouse Dam. This is elephant carcass over here. So I do need to also call the sighting in because I have not done that yet. Yes. I'm just going to take a wide berth. I think we might be lucky and even, oh, I don't know, it's going to be tricky. I want to just also try and get a view of the other individual because it's obviously not great. But they're a bit shy this morning. They don't even want to look at us. Fair enough. They've been busy. There's even lion tracks going down there. Um, can we look at this other individual though? Sorry, I, I don't, we, we've had a look at him. Let's look at this beautiful boy now. 
which is going to be an even better gap. Got him? So I just want to line it up. There we go. That That's a nice view of a lion, isn't it? Look, he's perfectly framed. Hello, beautiful boy. You are stunning. Okay, so that's really good to know. So what I will do in my notebook, which I have with me, is that I will update my notes and, and uh, obviously add in that very obvious feature of the individual we just saw that his... Uh, what did I say? It's his left ear that has a quite a big notch on it, a very scrappy mane. I'm now obviously hunting for a notebook. Notebook, where are you? I think I actually took it out. I might have left it in my bed last night. I was going through some some old stuff. I was actually reminiscing about uh, about the lines of the Mara. I found a page that I wrote maybe from 2017, and I was like, well, oh, that's quite cool. But I'll find something to write, and I always have a notebook lying somewhere. What a beautiful cat, though. It's like, you know, chalk and cheese. But you find that in every single coalition of male lions. You know, some individuals, and it obviously it all depends on genetics, especially when it comes down to their manes um, and what, they, what they're going to look like. So for those who are not familiar with how coalitions of lions form, that's why we're here to learn. So some of you, of course, you've heard this a thousand times, but if there is anybody else that's new that's watching, it's important that we, we do go over some of this information. So male lions don't have to be born within the same pride to form a coalition, although that's normally what happens. So if a pride of lions has a couple of young male lions of a similar age, at some point that, that they're going to be moved out. That age varies quite a bit it depends on the current males within the pride and I suppose the relationship between the mothers too because they get a bit sick of the boys and uh, you know can put a bit of pressure on them but it's normally the co original coalition males which would be their fathers uh, they'll push them out anywhere from about three to three and a half sometimes a little bit earlier than that and sometimes even a little bit later sometimes lions will stay over four years you know with in a pride maybe even closer to five years but that's uh, that's pushing boundaries a little bit but again we can't we can't put a blanket term over everything because animals just actually do what they want and we've seen so many differences you know some leaving early some leaving later um, so it depends what's happening. We might even find the pressure for food could have something to do with that too. If there's not enough food around and the prides get quite big, prides can split or maybe even sub-adult males might be pushed off even earlier. And then of course, so there could be li male lines from different females within the pride, but then like I said, sometimes what happens is that you might have one individual or two males join up with another, completely unrelated. It's not something that doesn't, it doesn't always happen a lot of the time, but it does happen. It's not like it's uncommon. Um, yesterday I was telling a story about how two very old male lions joined up in their senior years, which was quite interesting. You know, normally when you're much older, you're quite established and you're, you know, it is just, it is what it is. If you've lived on your own for most of your life, then you're probably going to stay that way. And uh, yeah, Freddie and Kru uh, Freddie, not Freddie Kruger, Freddie and Solo joined up many, many years ago. They are most certainly not around anymore. Uh, this is like well, way back in 2014, 2015. So, so quite some time ago. Hello, boys. Been wreaking havoc on Juma. We've just been letting everybody know that this is your turf, potentially. And I have to be honest with all of you, I didn't hear any roaring last night because I was so fast asleep. So fast asleep that I didn't hear anything. Can you believe it? Greg, thank you so much. Yeah, it was quite difficult to, it wasn't difficult to track them. It was just the, the ground, like I was saying to you, it's a mixture between sand and then some sections are clay. When that clay is drying up now, it's so hard, so you can't see anything. And then while you're, while you're driving and talking, you, I'm not looking at the road anymore. And, you know, I missed it and I was panicked at one point. I got off the car and I was like, I have no idea where these tracks are. I've driven over what was, you know, what was here while we were live. So I was like, oopsie. So I panicked and I tried to figure it out and I just thought, okay, let's just carry on going down Twin Dams. That was basically their direction and hopefully we'll find them. So, so nice, Greg. I'm glad that you've seen these boys for the first time. So, yeah, so the black dam males were born in the giraffe pride. So they, they come from the Thorny Bush uh, Game Reserve. That's where that pride is uh, seen quite quite often. And then their father is known as the giraffe male. I've never seen the giraffe pride, nor have I seen the giraffe male. But I believe he's quite an impressive 
individual. Yeah, lovely boys. It's very nice now that that light is starting to just catch their eyes, which is so lovely. Now, I don't see any obvious scarring seen as though we're looking at his face. Nothing that I think is really going to last. So we have to be very careful when, when using scars as identifying features because they can heal quite well. And it normally just takes a bit of time for the hair to grow back. So, you know, big nicks and notches on, on ears. Or, well, I mean, if they've got a big cut across their eye, that's, that's quite something. So you can see this individual also right at the tip of his ear, on his right ear. There's just a slight little, little tear. Again, very common injuries around lines. You often see it around the face, on the ears, and then again towards the, the nether regions around the rump. They often have quite big scratches. Your mane is a bit on the damp side. That's what, this is what actually happens to my hair when I, if I wash it and, or, and then it doesn't dry properly, it mats just like a lion's mane. It does exactly that. Or as soon as it starts to do that mizzle, that, that little drizzle, my hair also it starts to not doesn't frizz, but it just all of a sudden goes. You, you can have dreadlocks. I think I'm actually supposed to have dreadlocks, to be honest. Oh, you must be so tired from roaring and walking. The tough life of a male lion, and I really mean that. It's not an easy life. I don't think if you believe in reincarnation and all that type of stuff. I don't know if coming back as a male lion would be. A fun time. I'd rather come back as a, a really big elephant bull, a tuskless elephant bull, because then that way no one would really have any need to bother me. Igor says it must be really tough sleeping 20 hours a day. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I would love that. I'd hardly sleep at all, so I'd be living my best life if I could sleep for that long every single day but I'm not a lion good morning good morning everybody what a fantastic time to be out on a safari this morning the sun is out it's nice and cool and there's a lilac breasted roller that is sitting very happily perched on a branch fluffing itself up waiting for that sun to warm it up nicely today i'm scared to even move too much in case it flies away my name is tess i'll be taking you out on rusty for the morning behind the camera today isn't paul and we've started with almost a rolling start with lion tracks everywhere on the property so between taylor and myself we're going to try and find the lions but the lilac breasted roller is a great way to start the morning with a pop of color a little bit of calm and some amazing bush sounds to start your day It's only around 16 degrees Celsius this morning on Juma, which is 61 degrees Fahrenheit. This roller is still very much in the shade. But I think once the sun has at least managed to reach the bird, the bird might get a bit more active once it's warmed itself up. We had a very chilly night last night, so I'm sure it must have had a bit of a cold experience. But luckily those feathers will keep it safe. Now, I don't know if you heard, but there were lions on dam cam last night. They were roaring through the night. I've got lion tracks on Voyatella Access coming from power lines straight towards quarantine past camp and down to the dam. So I think Taylor's going to be checking down around the dam area. I'm going to be going northwest to check around Sandy Patch again for those males that were around the gate to see if this is the same males or different males because... It sounds like there were five young males together that have been spending a bit of time around Baobab Dam. Last night at about 8 o'clock they started crossing into Juma towards Sandy Patch. There were reports from the vehicles in Biffleshook. 
But if there's anything else you'd like us to look for today, if there's any questions you have for us, anything you'd like us to chat about, or even a story you want to share, maybe you want to share a penny, you know, I'll give a penny for your thoughts on which males you think might be around the area, please do let us know. We are live, we are interactive, and we cannot wait to hear from you. It is the best part of our day, and definitely helps us a lot, in fact, so we can't wait to hear from you. You can see the roller starting to move a bit more. Its head is moving a lot. Oh, there's a stretch. Are you getting ready to fly? Maybe just waking up slowly. I don't know if it would have perched here all night. Maybe it arrived here this morning. I would think it would have maybe gone up into a more sheltered tree so that it was out of the breeze because there's quite a chilly breeze that's been coming through. Maybe it's just getting itself ready in the perfect spot to start hunting today. It's chosen a great area. It's in a little clearing. This is normally where we see that genet that Cedric always finds on Viotella Access. Oh, a little hop. Uh, Jackson, good morning. Thank you so much for joining myself and Mpo and the rest of the crew on safari this morning. Hopefully it's going to be very successful. Bye, Rola. It's flown over to the other branch. Can you still see it? Kind of. I wonder if I could roll us backwards. Oh, no. Okay, I don't want to start in case it completely flies off, but you can see it's starting to get ready. So I'll give it a few seconds and then I'll reposition. Just because it's only just landed, it's very tempted to fly off because it hasn't settled yet comfortably. But it definitely looks like it's looking for the sun and it's getting ready to find some yummy beetles and other insects crossing Vuyotula Access today. Right, I'm going to try and reposition a little bit. Wish us luck on this side and I'll send you over to have a look at what the weather is doing for the rest of the locations. Nice brown hooded king fisher. Right on top there. Is it? Right on top. As you can see, a beautiful brown hooded king fisher. Cindy D. Definitely it'll be nice to see rhinos. We I haven't seen rhinos for quite some time, Cindy D. Um talking about that, actually very interesting because I'm actually even trying to think now. Have I even seen rhinos since I've been back? Do do do. I'm not too sure, Cindy. I think it might. Oh, look at that rhino. The kingfisher has just decided to disappear. I don't think I have. Oh, that's right. Yes, I did. That's right. Thanks, Nadine. Yes, yes, yes. I did. I did have that female. It was, you know, it's that, those burnt teats and a, a male. That's right. That's when all Marips bumped into us as well while we were busy watching them. Indeed. So yes, indeed, we did. But but that was quite a while back. That was the last time. That was. That was like two weeks ago. <laughs> two weeks ago. So. So they are around here somewhere, but well, somewhere on in the area. But it would be nice to see them again. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Oh, it's nice to see that uh, brown hooded kingfisher. I oh, love them. It was nice to take a look. I still got that beautiful blue, electric blue on the side of their wings. That's one thing, our kingfishers around here are absolutely stunning. Even the small ones, like your malachite kingfisher, the pygmy kingfisher. Um, they're very small. The pygmy one is like so small. And the colors, like little butterflies. Little butterflies. But yes, well, we are going to continue heading to central towards us. Uh, hopefully the line, well, finding some line tracks. Let's head over to Pridelands. And I think Chris is doing some birding. Okay, so it's birding Sunday from the looks of it and we have a woodpecker and I'm going to ask the viewers to tell me what woodpecker we are looking at 
And this is the male. Oh, no, it's gone. Odie says he sees it. It's going to come out now. So it's the male woodpecker of this particular species of woodpecker. The female does not have any red on the head. I'm not sure if what we had there were enough for us to ID it. I know what it is. Odie's going to have to guide me. I lost it now. The horizontal branch. Yeah. There's a thin branch behind it and it's coming up behind there. Okay. Thanks, Odie's got it. Woodpeckers are notoriously tricky to identify, especially for beginner birders. But each and every woodpecker has got one or two little telltale features that you can look on to and try and find out what it is in this case there are two things that you can look at actually i would call it three things so it's a very dark throat Norm, good morning, reckons it's a bearded woodpecker. Now, Norm, the bearded woodpecker, it's a very good call. It looks very similar to this one. So what we need to find out, if we see this bird again, we need to figure out the male bearded woodpecker. It's got that little red cap, but the front or the frontal part of its face, it's got like a black and white spotted area. And they've got a very distinct dark throat, which this one had. But then they've got that very distinct malar stripe running from the eye. And I don't recall seeing that. Definitely a very dark throat. I didn't see a very distinct eye stripe. I did see the red cap, but one thing that caught me was the slightly spotted or streaked chest, which should eliminate. Taylor says an acorn woodpecker. Taylor, unfortunately not. That's a species that we do not find here. Come on, show your face, bird. You see, I'm too short. Shreya says a male bearded woodpecker. Shreya, I have not concluded myself which species this is. I'm going to have to stand up. You might see a bit of a shake on the camera. I just need to reach up and see. All right. Okay, now I can see its face. Turn around. In a world full of upheaval, we all need a quiet and safe place. A place where anxiety and stress don't exist. A place where life carries on. Slip away into a brand new show exclusively on Wild Earth. Just nature.
that is a Bennett woodpecker. And Audi called it, it's a Bennett woodpecker. So with the bearded woodpecker, the female does not have a red cap at all. We initially didn't stop here for the woodpecker. We actually stopped here for a magpie shrike. Anyway. I reckon we should probably leave this woodpecker alone. It's given us great entertainment here. And um, go and see if we can't find some cats. Since the woodpecker is hiding from us now. Right. I think let's let's head on. Let's continue. Yes, as you can see, we've got two hooded vultures up here at Niala South. I'm still trying to figure out these uh, for the lions because I've got the audio coming from this area uh, earlier. Um, but now, the hooded vultures are here. These two were with the lions yesterday on Batelier Road uh, on this side. And I've got some audio just south of it. Just hold on. Let's just go to take a look at Panda. I've got to, it sounds like law. The sneezing of lions down here. Sorry, I just want to quickly double take a uh, check on this here because the wooded vultures are here and uh, I heard like some sneezing. And I just I can take a look. Ah, yeah, they are. <laughs> it's just around the corner. <laughs> yes. Yeah, they are. Sorry. I was just, uh, I heard sneezing. Oh, hello. <laughs> there they are. Oh, hello. There. <laughs> good morning, girls. Good morning, good morning. Yes, I was about to say, these two, I saw these two wooded vultures up in a tree, and I'm thinking, that's interesting, because they were with them yesterday. I know these two that were hanging around with the lions, and then I heard like a sneeze, and it was a lion sneeze. And here we are. We've got the Telemati breakaways here on the other south. Wonderful. Look at that golden light. <laughs> yeah, that was funny now. Okay, they were just around the corner. I could have just gone, like, went, like, I can say, 10 meters further on, and I would have, like, at least seen them. I was sitting with those, with those, uh, Vultures for uh, about maybe five, six, seven minutes. <laughs> Snoozy cats. Here we are. So yeah, yeah, they've got the Telemati breakaways on the other south and uh, yeah, as I say, thanks to those two hood vultures that brought us to this side and uh, it looks like they did not move too far from Batalia Road, so from where they were left yesterday afternoon or yesterday evening, um, give and take maybe about 200, 300 meters away from here, just on the other side of this drainage line. So yeah, but they had full bellies last night, and that's exactly what I thought. I said, well, I'm sure they're not going to move too much. But yeah, definitely all snoozy cats for the morning. <laughs> Hello, little one. Oh, watch, he's going to yawn. <laughs> cute. Very cute. So yeah, I'm sure those bellies are now almost, oh yeah, kind of, 
coming to the point where they're becoming flat. So they digested most of that uh, meat or the protein that was in their bellies last night, sleeping it off. They'll hang around here for the morning, I'm sure, for, for the day. And it's become quite a warm day, so I'll hang around here and then most probably later this evening they will move, move on. Tom, yes, definitely. As I said, it was quite a funny situation finding them here. As I said, those two hooded vultures that was in the tree that's next to us, they stopped just around the corner and actually viewed them and I heard a sneeze from a lion. And I thought, okay, well, that's interesting. I came around the corner and here they are. But it's nice to see these uh, telemati breakaways again. I'm just trying to see if all... Yeah, all three females are here, the five youngsters, so that's three females and five cubs. Cubs are just over a year old and uh, of course the three girls, that's what the pride uh, build up is. And those beautiful females are absolutely stunning condition and uh, yeah, definitely we got to see them quite often over the last uh, couple of weeks. I don't know what I heard this morning. I heard like uh, lions fighting. Maybe there might have been Wiffelzook area. Sue, yes, lions. It is always nice to find them, especially earlier on, because at least you still get their one or two of their heads up and maybe moving. Um, you know, once it starts heating up, uh, you'll find that these lions tend to rather relax a little bit more and try and take cover in the shady areas. But yeah, nice to get to see them now this morning. But I'm thinking that audio of lions might have come up from Biffleswick Dam. Maybe we are heard a bit of fighting or other it sounded like maybe males might have been a little bit further north. Maybe for the Torchwood, might be for the the Kruger male that is that side as well. I'm not too sure. That's just a long shot at a at a guess there. But yeah, this pride has been definitely pushing into this area right now, which is nice, coming a little bit further south, southeast. I mean, I have, I've never seen this pride so far into where we are now. Of course, Batalera, that's just south of us, and of course, Niola south. So maybe because of those new males that's in the area, it could be pushing them quite a bit. Of course, they have to kind of make other plans to keep these cubs safe from new males, two new boys that's just arrived now, about a couple of months ago. Giraffe call, yes, definitely. If you've got the Talamati breakaway pride, then, then the world is all right, I fully agree. That's, uh, it's always nice to see them. Uh, and as I say, they, this pride has really grown on to me quite a bit now because getting to see them, getting to see their personalities, their characters, each individual, and it is absolutely quite uh, a pleasure having to just sit with them and, and enjoy these lines. All right, I might try to reposition here. I think we're just trying to get to see what other... Uh, the rest of the prides is. I'm just trying to see, what do you think? And then we try and get in there. Yeah, let's try and do that. I just, want to go, I just want to try and get into this little, you can see the rest, the rest of the pride. Thanks, hooded vultures. Can I go back there? youngsters and the three golds one of course the big male uh, the dominant male of this pride is known as the s8 or slash Mbali male and he's just a one male and most of the time he will be hanging around with the pride but I think because that torchwood pride another pride came into Juma uh, not last night the night before 
Um, I'm sure you went to go and investigate on what's happening with that pride. Maybe another male as well entered the area. Maybe it could have been the Kruger male. So sometimes he's got to look after this territory. He's got to make sure that uh, this, this pride, these cubs, are kept safe from other males. And uh, so, of course, people always think males are, are male lions are lazy, but they're not. They are very busy at night time. They are moving up and down, patrolling, making sure that that territory is uh, kept clear from others. Uh, John, yeah, you know, sometimes you'll find hyenas trailing like, uh, you know, like a pride like this, but not close by, you know, they know that it's, it's, it's pointless. Even if these lions do make a kill, you know, if it's one hyena, there's no way that hyena is going to push off these three big females, especially that they've got five youngsters with them. I mean, you know, motherly instinct will kick in there immediately and it all, you know, if that hyena is deciding to try and take on these ones, well, good luck on that hyena. It would have been a bad choice. So, I mean, that hyena will suss it out. It'll say, okay, well, this is a pointless uh, task and effort. Rather, let's move away and try and rather trail something like a, a leopard or maybe wild dogs. A little bit easier, smaller predators. So, yeah. But if these females have made a kill and are eating on something, yeah, then, of course, sometimes you'll find one or two hyenas in the background, far in the background, just waiting for that opportunity to come and uh, grab some scraps if there's some bones left or whatever's left behind I'll wait for that but to challenge them not a good idea and I mean these females are honestly to me these telemarty breakaway females these three girls are very big they are proper size females definitely they they remind me a lot of uh, the Chalala pride uh, females good genes from the Mapojos nice big girls and very strong girls as well. So, yeah. Definitely a stunning pride, this. Now, with these five youngsters, I mean, these five youngsters have got uh, three of them are male and two of them are female. So those two females, once they start growing up and all that, they're going to stay with the pride. They're going to stay with the three older females. And, of course, uh, the pride is just going to uh, grow in uh, status, the status, and of course they'll just have definitely like five females would be just quite a formidable pride then, especially with big girls. We are just making our way into a sighting, so I'm just going to slowly pull up around the corner here and we'll just wait. Hey guys, uh, just a quick update, I just uh, located on uh, the Talamati breakaway, so three more fuzzies, five. Okay, we don't need information about the Talamatis. Okay, we're just going to turn off here, listen, and what we're actually listening for is not the animal, but vehicles. The vehicles are in this block, and instead of bunda bashing through, which I really don't want to do, we're just going to stand by and wait. But of course, the morning sounds are still going strong, so as we actually listen for vehicles and activity, we're also going to sit and enjoy the birds.
miss these morning sounds when I'm in the city. Not the vehicle, <laughs> the birds. <laughs> but as I mentioned, we are navigating and hopefully the next time you see us, we will be sitting with a leopard. <laughs> Look at this one, hello. So these Talamati breakaways are now resting very nicely, except this one. And one is just kind of uh, enjoying watching those vultures that's sitting in the trees behind, or the tree behind us. Not. I don't want to watch anymore. Shaking your head at us. So put my radio off there. Of course, just cleaning and just uh, making sure that all the paws are nicely cleaned up for the morning and for the day. And of course, with those rough tongues of the lion, they look very, very rough tongues. And when they do lick their paws like that or their coat, if there is anything on it, like maybe blood that's from a kill or maybe a tick or something that's lying and biting its leg. And of course, just by licking like that, sometimes it can actually lick those things off, and lick the blood off. And as well as all the dew drops that's been sitting on the grass now of course gets rubbed off onto the lion's coat and when they do lick like that they actually get a little bit of moisture from it oh he wants to bite his tail <laughs> that's your own tail buddy that's your own tail yeah. Florentine, yes, definitely. These cubs have grown quite a bit. I mean, it's over, I think, just about like over a year now, a year and two months now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, yeah, they are growing very quickly. And uh, this is where this part, the time of their lives where they start kind of really become more interested in moving with, uh, with the females when they do go on their hunts and starting to learn on how to, you know, stalk and how to approach... Uh, Prey species, <laughs> <That's what I'm laughs> and um, yeah, I just do uh, enjoy this time of their of their lives, and it's it's amazing that we can at least get to witness them now quite often that they are spending more time on Juma, which is very interesting. So maybe there's a little bit of uh, pressure coming from the north um, as well. So who's pressurizing them from the north? I'm not too sure. Could be the tortured pride that's been now situated there and I know the tortured pride is definitely much larger uh, compared to uh, these the, compared to this pride so maybe that's why they are pushing and keeping more down here in the south towards uh, Juma area which is definitely I'm not complaining about because I think it's for us and for all you wild earth viewers out there as well that we can get to see them more often and I mean then Kuhumas now I mean, the Nkumas aren't coming in anymore, hardly coming through. And so especially that uh, the two evokers of Dark Mane and Blondie that's passed away. Um, it just seems like, you know, the line, the line, the line dynamics have changed quite a bit. So that's why, I, that's why I'm thinking that these Telemati breakaways are realizing that, well, Juma is, uh, you know, an area, a property that they can move into and there's no pressure from other lines. So... Uh, that is also quite an interesting thing. And I know that the, the Nkumas are now spending a lot of time down in Mala Mala, uh, further, even further east, so southeast. So Mala Mala, Kruger Park boundary, that area. So, yeah. Uh, Right, while well, we are going to sit with our beautiful tawny cats, the Telemati breakaways, let's head over to Lauren as she's got a feline to show all of you. Well, I actually haven't made my way into a sighting just yet. We kind of bumped this sighting. We were on our way to Shudulu, who's really not far away, and we've come across another leopard in a tree. I think it could possibly be Tavangumi, but no one knows. We've just come across this leopard. We were on our way to Shudulu, and I think that means, Davi, we're well and truly back at Juma. What do you think? 
Yeah. Just in case you were doubtful, we're back at Juma for sure. Now, please confirm my G for me, everyone. But I think... From that face, it looked like it could be Tabangumi. But you know what we can do? Shall we get a little bit closer? We didn't know who it was, so we didn't want to get too close. I don't know who's really skittish and who's not skittish around here. But Shadula's just in here, and that's where we were going. So I wonder, I wonder... if there will be some sort of meeting between the two. Is that you, Tabangumi? Davi, can you work with this or do you want me to go forward more? Would you look at that? This is what I missed. When people talk about the Sabi Sands, they say all you need to do is kick a marula tree and the leopard falls out. And there you have it. And of course, Miss Shadulu does have two cubs. Unfortunately, they are on Arethusa, but you never know, there's a lot of pressure in the West. That, I know, hasn't changed. Oh, hello. James Richard, thank you so much. Not only is it good to hear your name, but yes, Tavangumi. He's got a really unique face. Yes, he does have dots and he spots, but if you can't see that, he's got quite a striking face. So Tavangumi's here, Shadulu is literally just in the block to my left, to the west. Didn't expect to see a leopard this morning. We tried the hyenas, we went to a few dens. I know that they are supposedly denning on Little Gary, but they're at the stage where they're very mobile and although they will use a den site, it's not so sedentary. And I remember this happening in the past with the Juma clan. So it's just a case of keep checking the familiar dens, following tracks. They may move back onto Juma. There may even be some females that could possibly be pregnant at this time of year. So unfortunately I didn't have any luck, but hey ho, I've got a leopard. I've got a leopard in a tree. Oh, you beautiful thing. Pangolin galore, absolutely. Beautiful pose with a leopard in a tree. It's funny because we were on our way to the Shadulu sighting and I just looked down and I saw male leopard tracks and I thought, huh? This is a bit odd. She do lose there, but we're following a male. I didn't think it was Mulwati because he was seen on the dam cam last night and went along Central. We're currently on Aubrey's Road. And it's tough and gloomy. It's amazing how these animals just ebb and flow around one another. The chemical fences are there. The boundary lines in terms of chemicals are there. They're odorless to us, completely invisible to us, but not to them. And it's their decision whether to cross it or not. It's not impenetrable. They can, of course, cross it. But they've been warned. They understand the information. They understand the chemicals. Ooh, there's another male here telling me to keep out. Huh, I'm going to cross anyway. Or maybe I'm not going to cross. I don't want to encounter this male. And they all just ebb and flow around one another. But Shadulu was moving this way. She went flat. I just wonder if we'll get a look at her too this morning. Oh, Jackie, thank you so much. You're saying good morning to us, Lauren and David. And you're happy to have us back. We're happy to be back. A year is a long time and it was a busy year. And we just got back from Botswana. I'll tell you all about it, don't worry. And we're now in Juma with a leopard. It's been a whirlwind, but a good one. And we really did miss the leopard. You just don't, you definitely don't get anything like that at Amakala. And Medikwe, we did have a few leopard sightings, some live, some not, mostly not. And 
but they're not like this, to be honest. They're special, but they're definitely not like this. Okay, a vehicle's trying to get around us, so I think we're just going to go forward a bit. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, Lauren's back. Okay, we're going to try and reposition as best as we can here to see Chava and Gumi, but we're going to send you guys over to Cedric and his sleepy lions. And flat. Bloop. <laughs> there we go. And when Cubby's just looking, he's like, yeah. <laughs> that's what we should do. Yeah, but a lot of people say, oh, lions are so, you know, they look you know, sleepy and there's not much happening. But when, it, when they are active, and when there is something happening, they become quite interesting and it's quite awesome just to follow them. All right, well, let's go quickly to Lauren and see what she's got. Should do lose here. I've lost visual with my own eyes, but he can see her. Oh, he can see her. Shoot, where have you gone? It's so thick. She literally just walked by. She's a mama, though. I don't know if she's just going to get out of the area. But she would be able to smell him. There's no way she doesn't know there's another leopard here. He 
really sees her. Okay, I obviously don't want to lose them and it's so unbelievably thick right now, but let's see if we can try and find them. I don't know if she'll run. She's got the briefest view of her. Gabby, I'll need your wonderful eyes as well. Gumi. Can you see him, Dove? I don't know where Shadula is going. Sorry, everyone, my feet don't quite reach the pedals on Rusty. I do have a pillow. These cars were not really um, equipped for small females. The saliva coming from the mouth. I wonder if she's ran. Okay. His direction is surprising me a little bit. He's getting our same. boy. You see that flame and grimace pumping the chemicals into his former nasal organ to understand who was that leopard. He won't be able to tell by vision. He won't know just by looking at her. We do. Because we reckon the sort Tavi's of doing twists and turns his back here. He'll just see a leopard. He won't be able to identify any leopard through sight. He identifies them through chemicals. He's pacing here, he's not happy. Shreyas is asking, Davi, did you get that? Oh, we're on Aubrey's, Shreyas. Sorry, I did mention that. We are on Aubrey's road, maybe about halfway up. And he's pacing both sides of the road, but he's currently now on the eastern side. And she came from the west. So she came from the western side, crossed over. And isn't it amazing? They both met at the exact same spot. Can you see him, Dav? I'm thinking about reverse, and he's pacing in circles, so... No, I can see him now, I can see him, yeah. He's coming back again. He 
He's done this loop about three times now. He's literally gone round and round in circles. Should be long gone, I think. He saw her though, he definitely saw her, he was looking. It was actually Davi that said, I wonder if he's looking at Shadulu. Susan, that depends on a lot of factors. Probably not. But I'm not sure if Shadulu and Tavangomi have mated actually. I don't know, I've been gone too long to sort of have those details. If they have mated, then very unlikely. She's not in the car, my boy, I promise you. Okay, apparently they haven't mated. Male leopards are renowned for killing younger females, especially younger females that haven't yet come into estrus. But older females, mm, he absolutely could. I think that was what Ganyeni's fate was, which was very sad, an older leopard, so he absolutely could. He is the dominant male leopard around sort of the northwestern corner and I don't know how much interaction Shadulu and Tavangumi have actually had sorry I'm just trying to keep my eye on Tavangumi he's now going back the way Shadulu came I wonder if she ran back that way back west so Susan it would depend on a number of factors he absolutely could I really don't think in this case with these two individuals that Tavangumi would, but he's, he's antsy, you can tell by his behaviour. But I just didn't see which way she ran, unfortunately. That's thick. I remember when Tavangumi first arrived, all the boys, oh, they all fell in love with them. I think it's his really relaxed nature and, of course, gorgeous good looks. But Shadulu, as I mentioned, is a mother now and, well, she's always been a mother, but young cubs and therefore she is going to avoid any sort of situation that involves potential conflict. It's getting quite thick here. Do you think we can squeeze through here? <laughs> okay, we'll need to watch that antenna. Darby, let me know if you spot him. I have lost sight of him. This is literally where Shadulu came from. This is where we were on our way to. Where have you gone, boy? Ah, oh, he's right there. Can you get him? <laughs> I still recognize all the leopards. It's crazy. You just don't forget that. I find leopards really easy. I find hyenas easy, I find lions really difficult. I wonder if she was sitting here. I think she was maybe lying on this tree.
it's his role as a dominant male in an area, whether it is his territory or not, to know all the females, to understand who is around, who is the enemy, who are the mating opportunities. I think her name was Polly. Sorry, I'm just trying to navigate here. Uh, at least there's no sickle bush like, well, not compared to Medikwe. Um, most likely, I would say yes. That's a difficult question to answer because we're not leopards. But her sort of chemical signature that she'll leave behind, especially if she's been scent marking or just her urine, I would believe it would contain information that she is a mother. It would contain that hormone sort of um, composition that he would maybe be able to tell that. But again, that's really difficult to say. It's very subjective because we don't fully understand the chemical world and what they perceive when he is smelling her scent. And I read a wonderful book about animal behavior that described... Sorry, I just want to check something. Oh, it's just a stump. But it looks like a leopard. Um, <laughs> that described animals' chemical signature like a barcode. So if you imagine a barcode that you use to scan things in the shops, and they're all different. They look the same to one's eye, but when you scan it with the little beep, beep machine, they all contain a sort of different signature. They all have different information, and that's what the chemical signature is like. Each individual leopard will have its own barcode containing all the information you need to know about that leopard if you're a leopard. If you're not a leopard, well, to be honest, you're not going to really need to know all the information about a leopard. You're not going to really need to worry about that. Okay, so we're going to keep trying to follow Tavan Gumi for now, and you never know, we might bump into Shadubu. Yeah, just sitting here still with the, the Tanamati breakaways. They're still very fast asleep. And uh, we're just going to enjoy this moment with them and uh, listen to all the beautiful bird choruses that's happening around here for now. Yep, no, definitely. I think uh, if I have to come back as an animal, I'd love to come back as a lion. I think <laughs> too steep like this, but then again, it's just a tough life. Maybe you might see it might be easy like this, but at night time, it becomes. We have still got Mr. Tavangumi. He's 
He's very antsy. Can you use that word to describe a leopard? I don't know, but he is. I don't think the two of them, from what I can gather, actually knew each other were there. And then, of course, Zulu went for a walk and walked right into him. He's now moving the way. She's long gone, I'm afraid, which is a shame. I would have liked to know. My goodness, he's not making this easy for us. At least I've still got these off-roading skills from the past. You don't off-road at Amakala and Madikwe. Well, it's a bit of a different terrain. You don't off-road everywhere there as well. And I've stalled. Okay, he is heading back to Aubrey's Road. He's just doing loops and circles and pacing, agitated. You can visibly see that. I'm very happy to be back. Didn't expect quite the sighting this morning. We were just taking it easy, getting sort of familiar with what the... Oh, I can see him. He's running. What the roads look like now, how the cars are. And, of course, thought we were going to see Shadulu. But lo and behold, we've got to have Angoon. This is my first day back. I'm not sure I can keep up with you. You're making me work very hard this morning. He's still not a huge male. Do you know that? Not in comparison to... Well, I mean, I've not seen Mowati in a really long time, but... I don't think you would have heard that because I was talking and the angel was on, but he's sewing. Come on, boys, so again. I won't talk this time. Okay. That's the tree that we found him on. So he's just, he's looped all the way around and he's come back again to the exact same place where he first saw her. Go in at this tree again and see if we can catch up with them. Yeah. It's nice to hear a saw. That is a sound I have definitely not heard in a long time. It's very quick though. Do you see him, Dove? Yeah. You got him. I've got him. Ooh, stink bugs. Hmm. 
satellite home. He's just gone back to the road again. My goodness, so much for a static leopard sighting. Uh. Did you get that name, Dobby? Very, yeah, that's what I heard as well. Very? I hope we're right. <laughs> you said Dobby's camera work is a dream. My driving is not, but Dobby's camera work definitely is. You are correct on that one for sure. Dobby's one of our old school cameramen. I think he's going on seven years now. Part of the originals. <laughs> oh, I'm going to need to keep this radio up. Someone is on their way and I need to try and figure out how to get in here. But he's literally just looping and looping and looping. And that was quite fascinating to watch. I know you guys didn't see Shadulu, but it was so brief. The behavioural aspect of it, and we can only sort of glean what we can from watching the behaviour. Okay, we're going to try and keep up with Tavan Gumi, and we're going to send you guys over to Nick. Yep. Alrighty, welcome back to Kariha. We're still here at Scotia Dam, just doing a lovely bit of birding. And we've got a nice group of white-faced whistling ducks. Which is very cool to see. This is actually my first time to see white-faced whistling ducks here at Scotia Dam. It looks like there's about six or seven of them. All got their heads tucked in there a little bit, but you can see they've, like their name suggests, they've got that very white face. Got a little bit of uh, sort of chestnut rufous type of coloration on their chest going up towards their neck. And these are often birds that you hear calling when they are flying early morning, late in the afternoon. We've got some yellow billed ducks as well, blacksmith lapwings, so everybody really doing a little bit of uh, preening. Jeff, that's a good question. Uh, no, they're not restricted to the Eastern Cape. You'll find them largely throughout uh, most of South Africa. Both the white-faced whistling ducks and the yellow-billed duck as well. Relatively widespread. Uh, there has been a red-billed teal that's been moving around here. I'm just trying to have a look to see where it is. I can't see it for the moment. Got a bless book potentially coming down for a little bit of a drink here. Trying to decide which route that he'd like to take here. <laughs> that lapwing does not want the bless book here. Oh, look out. Tolerant these birds are of that bless book coming here. Obviously, it doesn't pose much of a threat, but it is a large bodied animal in relation to these ducks and these lapwings. 
It's a nice little bit of peaceful coexistence between our different species here. A beautiful reflection there of that blessed book. And you can see the sun is just starting to, to peek out behind the clouds every now and then. You see how that whiter color of the blessed book really becomes very striking. Wild Earth is looking for unique wildlife sightings filmed by you. They can be old or new from anywhere in the world and filmed on a camera or on your phone. In return, we will give you cash, an opportunity to win a prize and a chance to see your clip on TV with your name in the credits. It's easy. Head over to wildearth.tv forward slash content to find out more. A little bit you see how he's now put it down and he's combing through those feathers he's obviously gathered some of the oil from that preening gland and he's going to work it through all of those different feathers there now he's really putting on a good display for us of how these ducks go about cleaning and preening themselves He was up a tree. He was actually up the exact same tree that we originally saw him. He went up, he paced up and down. And now he's back to pacing on the ground. Tavangumi, my boy, Shadula's been called in on the radio. She's on power lines. Yes, you're not going to find her here. OK, let me turn around. <laughs> He was so beautifully up that tree. There we go. He has calmed down, I must say. The way he's moving, 
the speed at his, which he's moving, his panting, the saliva, it has calmed down. I think he's realised he's gone. But that was fascinating. I didn't expect Tavan Gumi to be the first leopard I saw here. Ravi and I were just saying that. I don't know who I thought it was going to be. Probably Tlalamba. He's moving north again. I don't quite know where Tavangumi's and TP, Tortoise Pan, I don't know where their territories meet. TP obviously comes in from the west and Tavangumi sort of comes in from the northwest, if you like. Now, territories are very fluid. They, they will always change. They're very dynamic. Yeah. They're not sort of fixed. Um, boxes that we would like to think they are so they will change however I'm not quite sure where that line is drawn between the two of them I've yet to meet TP I didn't meet him he was around when I was here last but for some reason I was just always really unlucky and never got the chance to actually meet him I think he's just going back to whatever he was planning on getting up to today. Oh, is this what you were planning on getting up to today? <laughs> is this okay, Dal? Yep. Chilling in the shade is a very good idea, actually. He's coming down now. Beautiful boy. And you know, it's fascinating. There are lots of leopards in Medikwe. For sure. They just don't have that same nature as the ones here do. And it is habituation, but not necessarily active habituation. I think you have to be really careful when you say that word because you do get habituation to the sort of extent at Swalu where you have people employed to sit with the meerkats and sing to the meerkats and read to the meerkats. That's real human habituation. However, on a different level, it sort of happens organically with the vehicles and the animal. It just takes some time. And from what I can gather, Mowati is sort of calming down a little bit in terms of he's not so skittish around the vehicles as he used to be. And that's just sort of passive habituation, if you like. And that just happens through time and sort of taking it easy. But in Medikwe, there's such a high population of lions, very high populations of lions and other predators. So the leopards behave very differently there. And although we saw a few, it was nothing like this. Can you saw for us again, please? I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to. What, what is unusual? His relaxed nature or what we've just witnessed with his encounter with Shudulu? I'm not sure. I'll wait on AFC clarifying that. Aubrey's road was always a road I didn't drive too much. Dorothy, his reaction with Shadulu was really not unusual at all. Um, leopards are solitary, although there are more and more examples sort of coming out of the woodwork of leopards spending some time together. At the end of the day, their social structure really is solitary. And if you're a territory holder, you are claiming quite a selfish 
take on that piece of land and resources. You're saying this area is mine, which is actually quite selfish behavior. And if anyone enters into your territory of your own species, you're going to want to know about it. Whether it's male or female, you're going to want to know who is in your territory. So the fact that he saw another leopard, instantly assessed the situation, came down the tree and tried to analyze who that leopard was, analyze her scent, process all the details, female, how old she is, is she a dominant female? And if he knows Shadulu, then he'll recognize Shadulu. The leopards will recognize the scent of other leopards that they know or they've interacted with. So there wasn't really anything unusual about it. He behaved quite in the manner that all leopards do behave and when they come across another leopard that they sort of don't know, AKA not kin. I think it's safe to say he's very relaxed now. <laughs> hmm. Tamangumi, you are on camera. <laughs> the heat is already through the roof, although we don't have a roof, haha, <laughs> which is actually joyous. <laughs> it's really good not to have a roof on the car anymore. And I have been warned that the low felt recently feels like a volcano. And I think we're going to be sitting in the shade for quite some time. But we are going to stick with this boy as long as we can. And we're going to send you over to Ben in Mitikwe. Thank you, Lauren. Yes, I'm sure you're delighted to be back in Juma with all those leopards. I'm quite jealous of you having found Tabungumi. Uh, I'm yet to find my first Medikwe leopard, and I sense it may be sometime, but we will hope. But we have got something rather interesting. We are at Skoko Pan, uh, which has no other animal activity because there's water everywhere at the moment. But we were here uh, yesterday, um, and this was not here. And we've got a couple of foam nest frog nests that have appeared in this sickle bush and is that a sickle bush I better just double check for having just said that no it's not it's a little acacia of some description i have to get a little bit closer to find out exactly which one um but you can also see plenty of southern mast weaver nests there actually the one at the bottom we saw a weaver busying himself preparing that nest a couple of days ago and you can see the one above it now has a foam nest frog nest well, it's a lot of nests, <laughs> has a foam nest, frog nest attached to it. So we've got a little bit of sort of apartment sharing. Um, and interesting, it's almost exactly the same size. I wonder if he took the same architectural guidelines as the weaver. But very interesting to see how quickly these have uh, popped up just after the rains that we've had. So that will be created by that little tree frog we call the foam nest frog, or southern foam nest frog. And when the female is producing her eggs, remember in frogs it's external fertilization. So she produces eggs and then the male will also deposit sperm and she's got specialized glands on her back legs. And when she is doing that, she sort of whips them up or say it's a little bit like egg whites and she creates this foamy mass and the male deposits sperm and the eggs will be developing inside that little mass there. Uh, that will have now hardened in contact with the air and that's a wonderful way to protect against predators and also from the sunlight and from drying out. Uh, and it is actually edible, not that I'm going to go and demonstrate that, but because it's protein-based, uh, one can eat that, although I don't think it's a great amount of nutritional, nutritional requirement in there. Um, and when the eggs develop, as they get a little bit heavier and that starts to degrade... It will drop down, or the little tadpoles, partially developed tadpole frogs, will drop down into the water which is hidden by that grass. Um, and that's a good question as to what would uh, predate on it. Normally in the water, then uh, potentially fish will eat them. Um, but I would think up here it will be birds. I mean, food source is a food source. I don't know of anything that actually specialises in 
frogs' eggs um, up uh, yeah, above the water level. But I would imagine small birds would take advantage of that just for a nice little burst of protein. But I honestly don't know for sure. I can't think what else. But also probably um, there are, I'm sure there are some insects or little arthropods that would parasitize on them if they were out in open view. But I would think birds would be the most likely culprit. Uh, but honestly, I've never sort of officially heard of it happening. I was hoping to find our little weaver because we were watching him say, weave that grass into the nest there, but I haven't, haven't seen him at all today. Maybe he's decided he doesn't want to share with this foamless frog. Not that he probably didn't have a great deal of say in it either. Other than that, doing a little bit of birding here and there, um, but nothing wants to sit still long enough, for, long enough for us to put on camera. But I see just back and right of where it is, you might be able to get a glimpse of a giraffe eager if you go right a little bit. Is he there? Or is he behind the tree for you? Sorry, left, not right. No, it is right. See the giraffe in there? Yeah, there we go. There are some giraffe on the horizon. Sorry, I'm facing the wrong way, looking at my screen. So left and right are upside down for me. So we've got a male in the foreground, and looks like a female in the background, just looking at those ossicones, even though this one at the front looks quite... Oh, there's three. Uh, it looks quite furry. I think that's a young male just by looking at the, the girth of those ossicones. They look fairly solid. Males having larger ones than females. Four giraffe, apparently. Lots of giraffe. They're just appearing as if by magic. But busy feeding. It's actually a very nice, cool, very pleasant morning this morning. There's a little bit of intermittent sun and some cloud cover. But very, very nice morning. The animal's taking, or well, reaping the benefits of not having to rush around too much. It has been quite quiet uh, this morning. and We haven't seen a great deal of mammalian activity, but it's still fun to explore. We've taken a few roads that we haven't taken yet, but haven't found anything of massive note. But maybe we're lucky and these giraffe come and have a drink at the dam and so at some point. Uh, Black Diamond, yes, giraffes are capable of vocalisation, but it's only under times of severe stress. So if you were, if the right word is to say lucky enough to see lions, for example, taking out uh, a giraffe or hunting a giraffe or putting it under extreme stress, then you might get some vocalisation from the giraffe. It's sort of a grunty, quite airy sort of noise. Um, I think I may have heard it once or twice, but it's, it's very rarely heard, but they can vocalise. So yes, can vocalise, but only under extreme circumstances. You can see the difference between in height between... Oh, no, that's a big male, and I still think that might be a younger male at the back. Hard to tell from this distance. Don't forget, also, sort of often we say, look at the top of those ossicones and if they're bald they're males and if they're fluffy they're females but a young male will also have fluffy oss ossicones he'll lose it over time as the skull deposits calcium um, and during sort of fights with other males uh, then they can get uh, they sort of rub off that hair in the process They have disappeared now, have they? Or is there one still floating along at the back? Oh, there we go. Bobbing along. These rather sort of... These sort of heads floating through the undergrowth. That certainly looks like a female looking at those ossicones. The lovely profile as well. Looks like she's busy ruminating. I don't see that one feeding, but you can see the mouth moving, so regurgitating some food and uh, making sure that 
she gets all that nutritional benefit from whatever it is she's eaten, most likely a mixture of sicklebush and other acacia species. Actually going back to that foam nest, it looks like it's in a blue thorn, which is oh, it's no longer an acacia. I have to keep reminding myself that will be a senegalensis now. The ones with the hooked thorns are senegalensis and the straight thorns are now vachelias. Did not sound like live live there apologies <laughs> look who's sleepy now we're exhausted after that morning and we've just tucked ourselves away in the shade which is ideal and we're sleeping <laughs> i've forgotten how much i love tabangumi that what probably was quite an exhausting morning for him he will absolutely have eaten into his energy budget on that. Pacing back and forth, smelling, panting, trying to pump all the chemicals into his vomeronasal organ, also known as the organ of Jacobson, which sends all the signals to the brain and the brain tries to understand what it is he's smelling. And although these animals live in a chemical world, we don't, but that does not mean we're not a little bit chemical. Although we're getting worse and worse and worse as we get sort of, as the years go by, humans are losing their ability to tune into their smell. We surround ourselves with smoke, cigarettes, um, pollutants in the air, fragrance. We smother ourselves in perfume and aftershave. But really, humans are supposed to be able to understand each other's pheromones. We are attracted to your partner, whatever sex they may be, through pheromones. Fundamentally, we do have that chemical aspect to us, but we definitely don't live in a chemical world like Tavan Gumi does. We're so restricted by that sort of lesson that we're taught we only have five senses. And to think about that is crazy to teach a child that you're limited by your five senses. Yes, we are not in tune to the Earth's magnetic fields. No, we don't echolocate or understand it or even are aware of it, really. We don't pick up on sort of electrical signals. But still, we have more senses than five. And the one I've been studying lately, I'm going to throw it out to you guys. Which of our senses is the unwanted sense? Which senses absence makes you feel like you, you're a superman, makes you feel like you have a superpower. I would say it's the sense that we try to avoid and we wish to dull. What sense am I talking about? I'm actually going to get some of you to try and guess. It's a sense that we rarely talk about as a sense, but it is a sense. And I know I talk about it all the time, but it's just such a broad topic. And you can just, there are so many different layers to the senses. And it's very species specific. Even if they're similar, dragonfly, butterfly, they're actually not the same in any way. They're using different senses. Butterflies are highly chemical. Dragonflies are highly visual. So even although they may be the same size and maybe people think, oh, they're just both insects that fly around. No, they're living in a completely different sort of world from each other. So when you're with a species, you really try, you have to try and think what senses it is they're using. What are they feeling? And because we witnessed such fascinating behavior this morning, that makes you think really what Tavan Gumi was feeling. And ultimately, we'll never know. But at least if we try and tune into the senses, we can get a little bit of a better idea when you're sort of trying to analyze behavior. <laughs> oh, hello. Can you guess? 
highest Dobby, which is the unwanted saints. Dobby got it. It's pain. We don't really think of that as a sense. Ah, oh, well done, Sir 50. You also got it. Well done. It is pain. We don't look at it like that. We sort of um, completely separate pain and talk about it in a different way than we do our other senses. But of course it's a pain. And in animals like Tavangumi here, it's obviously it's a warning. It warns of danger and injury crucial to their survival. So all animals, no matter what size you are, have things to be wary about. Danger, predators, threats. Sorry. Ah, bless me. And the sneezing begins. The Juma sneezing begins. And this makes it really difficult to actually tell whether an organism is experiencing pain and what it is they find painful. It's very subjective and to be honest, you will never know. Even humans are said to have different thresholds. We talk about thresholds. Is that biological? Are you talking on a biological level? Or is it actually in the mind? Can people tolerate pain differently because of their mindset? But that's a whole other topic. But when you look at animals, it's very difficult to know what type of pain they are actually experiencing. And we tend to assume that's the same across the board. All organisms will experience pain in the same way. But how do we really know that is most likely not true. Just like color is subjective and not, a, not the same across the animal kingdom or even wavelengths of light, the way that different organisms perceive that is different. Pain will also be different, but it's a very difficult one to talk about. And that's probably why we remove it and we say that we just have five senses and pain is not included. I guess pain is also a mishmash saints because it comes from sort of different elements but it definitely is a sense and although we're going to sit with Tavangumi a little bit longer when you come back to us we are going to keep diving into the senses and those senses that well you don't often think about so as we snooze in the shade with the spotted cat we're going to send you guys over to Chris to see what he's up to Looks like it's a birding Sunday today. And we have a snake eagle. And that is the brown snake eagle. One of the three snake eagles we have here. And two of them are actually called snake eagles. This one, the brown snake eagle, which now left. As well as the black chested snake eagle. Then there's another snake eagle around. It's not actually called a snake eagle, although you might have heard some people refer to it as a snake eagle. And that's the battalier. And the battalier is also a type of snake eagle. And there's a lot of reference to it being called a short-tailed snake eagle and so forth. Interesting is that uh, all the current books and apps that I've got still calls it a battalier. And in my opinion, it's a battalier. But yes, battaliers are snake eagles. If you choose to call it a short-tailed snake eagle, you can do that. But it's called a battalier. So there's the brown snake eagle over there. Now it's just perching there to try and uh, obviously look for reptiles or mainly snakes which is, is in fact the bulk of their diet.
the other day, uh, which is a bird I've been looking for for over a decade. And when I came to Madikwe earlier this year, I finally managed to find one. And now I'm finding them everywhere, which is often the way in birding. Let me know if you spot him. You've already landed somewhere. Ah, oh, there he is. There he is, there he is, there he is. Have you got him there? One o'clock, just above the ground. Flying away. And still flying further away. <laughs> OK, maybe this isn't going to work. Let's try again, see if we can catch up with him. We are tracking birds, taking it to the next level. Where did you go, little chappy? They're polyandrous, uh, sorry, polygynous species. Oh, he's back in the road again. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer, which means you've got one male with many females. So he's got those long tail feathers to try and attract a female, and he will choose a perch and sort of display, and the females will line up, and they will look at all the males available and decide which one they like the look of. There he is, there he is, there he is. You can just see him dragging his tail behind him. He's flopping around on the road. So we have pintailed widers, you've got paradise widers, and this is a shaft-tailed wider. Look at those incredible tail feathers. It must be very difficult to coordinate flight, dragging that behind you. If we'd arrived on the scene right now, we would never have even have the slightest little hint of the drama that went on earlier. And I wanted to share with you a quote, as I always do, <laughs> that was spoken by a 17th century philosopher called René Descartes. I don't actually know if it's a male or a female, but they thought of animals as automata. And they said, animals eat without pleasure, cry without pain, grow without knowing it. They desire nothing, fear nothing, and know nothing. <laughs> wow. That is a unbelievably inaccurate and harsh statement. Although Tabangumi is not doing very much right now, he's very flat. Just being in the presence of another organism like that, there's no way that you could say they say nothing, they feel nothing. Okay, we don't quite know what they feel, we'll never know. I don't even know what you feel. If you think about it, going back to pain, it's very difficult to even relate to one another. So if you tell me, for example, that you have a screaming headache, I don't really know what that means for you. I know what it feels like when I have a really bad headache, but I don't really know what that means for you. I can't really relate. I just sort of say to you, oh, I'm really sorry if you've taken a painkiller. It's very difficult to relate to pain. We can only sort of bring it back to ourselves. And when you think about pain, there's different levels to it. How we actually detect pain is through a specialized class of neurons called nociceptors and these neurons are all over our body and our organ tissues everywhere and these are the ones that detect harmful stimuli so extreme heat extreme cold pressure um, acids toxins chemicals anything that would sort of bring about pain in the body but when you think about it if you accidentally touch a really hot pan or Tavangumi steps on a really sharp thorn of a sickle bush. A reflex is triggered and he immediately lifts his paw and you immediately sort of withdraw from that hot pan before you realize what is happening, right? Before you understood what has just happened, you've already released your hand. You've detected the threat before you felt the pain. Then, shortly after you feel the pain, your hand's gonna be throbbing, you feel that blister. Oh, it's just agony, it's the worst pain. But you reacted before you felt the pain. And that's where the sort of separation comes in. You need to separate the act of sensing harmful stimuli, if you like, distinct from the feelings that they produce.
Rhonda, you are saying without the fear of pain, we would be in trouble. Absolutely, absolutely, it guides us. But we don't always acknowledge that, Rhonda. And diving into pain has been really fascinating. I've been studying it recently because we don't tend to recognize pain for that reason. It really gui guides us through our daily life, especially creatures like Tavan Kumi. He needs pain for his survival. And just to wrap up what I was saying, so it's very distinct the act of sensing harmful stimuli from actually feeling it. And that's where we use the word noisyception. So this is a sensory process in which we detect damage. Pain is the suffering that then ensues. It's actually two different things. We just say pain, pain, pain. We sort of throw that word out there. But actually, there's noisyception and then there's pain. And just always think of that sort of hot pan example. You move your hand before you know what's going on. That's noisyception. Then when you feel the pain and you feel the blister and the burn and the awful feelings that come, that's pain. And to think that organisms don't feel pain is bizarre. But to what level they do feel pain is a whole other ball game. And it's most likely going to differ across the animal kingdom. But how we will ever know, well, that's a different question. But to say that they don't feel pain at all, I think is foolish. And it is one of our senses. It's a sense that is guiding us through our life. You're right, Rhonda. And it's so widespread, but it's so subjective. Even between the sexes and, and humans, women obviously have period pain and that's just something a male will just never understand not because he doesn't want to be because he physically can so even between humans the differences are vast and it makes me wonder when i think of tavangumi to what level to what extreme he will feel pain maybe if he steps on that thorn of the sickle bush he maybe doesn't feel anything at all but i doubt it Gumi would love to know what Cedric is up to right now because I believe he's following up on Shadulu. Yes, I'm sure old Tavangumi would be quite uh, jealous that we uh, actually made our way into uh, the sighting of uh, Shadulu, this beautiful leopardess. Uh, as you can see, is just uh, enjoying a good old rest up here in this marula tree and uh, she is now just still looking around but panting quite uh, profusely I think she might have been uh, of course moving quite a distance this morning but oh, look at that face oh, hello girl definitely can see the suckle marks on her belly as well but it's difficult from where I think panda is at the moment but you can see that bronze kind of markings around on her belly See that uh, there is cubs that's still busy suckling Shops, from her. Uh, uh, but yeah, what a mission to get into the sighting and uh, to find uh, the other vehicle that was pretty much here yeah, in the middle of the block and we are pretty much between Impala Plains and uh, Zoe's just north of the Bella Nighties Road if anybody is interested on her location. And uh, yeah, it's, but she is looking in a westerly direction. Apparently she wanted to move back west. So she's got two cubs at the moment. They should be about four, four weeks old, four, four and a half weeks old now. And uh, they are kept in another property um, called Arethusa uh, Safari. And of course at, that, at the moment we do zone those areas so at least that those cubs and mom can have some private and personal time, which is very important, very important. Hey girl, well done. And I'm hoping she's going to be successful with those two new cubs now because unfortunately Shudulu has been quite an uh, unsuccessful mother. Um, 
but uh, there's so many different reasons to that as well. It depends on where her territory is situated. Sometimes you'll have two or three male territories that's overlapping on her territory, which could also cause quite a problem and quite a stir. But she has raised one cub, Alcara. So Alcara is now, of course, fully grown. She's independent. It's nice. Oh, nice to have always a leopard in a tree and <laughs> been very fortunate over the last several days with the leopards enjoying marula trees and uh, having them resting up here. Typical kind of iconic scenery that we always get to see. It's a beautiful thick tail. Oh. Of course, and that tail is going to be kind of a quite a, a useful thing over the next uh, few months, especially with her two cubs. Now, we're gonna, of course, she uses that tail as like a toy. So, we're kind of getting the cubs getting to kind of stalk the tail and play with the tail, and she uses it and she'll flick it from side to side, and uh, it is quite interesting. So, I'm hoping that we can get to see the, the youngsters very soon. Thanks, yes, Milo. Very nice to see Shuduli. It's always nice just to see uh, this uh, leopardessa. We haven't seen her for quite some time. Actually, we haven't seen her since she's had her cubs. I think this is the first time we've seen her after she's had her cubs. Am I right? I'm not too sure. Well, I haven't seen her this since. I haven't seen her since I've been back, so... No, I think, uh, Nadine, I think uh, that is, uh, I'm sure you're talking about Kara. Kara was on a kill. I might be wrong. Maybe. No, no, you're bringing back things here. I'm, I'm doubting myself. And you can just see, well, she is quite a big female. I mean, it's uh, seeing Shadulu to me. I mean, I've seen so many uh, female leopards in the Sabi Sands. And uh, this female is one of the largest females I've seen. Um, proper size, big dewlap. And uh, I mean, her father is the, uh, Mr. Anderson, the Anderson male. And I've got to see her father, very fortunate to see her father many years ago when I was at Arethusa. And... Uh, he is absolutely a stunning. So, sorry, no, 27th of January, that's when she was seen. Well, I don't think I saw her. Well, most probably it was James then. I think it must have been James that, that saw her. She's thinking for me now. What do you think? Hmm? I should do yeah, doesn't want to think too much now. You can see panting a little bit quick, and it is getting quite warm now, so I think she's definitely taking some time out. And I'm sure from where she is now, I'm sure she'll head straight back west towards her cubs and towards a den site. Looks like her tummy is quite full, so she might have made a kill during the night time. Oh, that's right, Shreyas. <laughs> Shreyas, <laughs> you know that uh, that is very true. I feel so so embarrassed now. <laughs> Shreya, thank you so much. I did have her. That's right, on, on Gary Main. That's right, because uh, she crossed over. We actually came back from the sighting of Nsumi. And uh, that's right, and we were coming back on Gary Main and we got to crossing from Juma <laughs> into Half Mines where she had that kill. She was feeding on that Tipala kill that was on the ground. Yo, Cedric. Mm. <laughs> I think I need another cup of coffee, don't I? Don't you think so, Shidulu? <laughs> but yeah, thanks for resetting my mind there, my brain. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely correct. 
Yeah, well, but uh, got to see it, but it wasn't the greatest of visuals. That's why I think I forgot about it. You know, it was like in half months, it was quite far in, and uh, um, yeah, it wasn't one of those ones where it was like you know, <laughs> it was stuck to my mind. But yeah, anyway, these we got to see her now, and that's the main thing: getting to enjoy this moment with this beautiful girl. As I was saying as well, by the, uh, the size of Shadulu and uh, knowing myself with uh, seeing a lot of females and uh, you know, for me she is quite large. She's one of the largest females I've seen in this area. As well as just thinking about uh, her father, the Anderson male, I mean, he was quite a beast. I mean, we used to follow his tracks and thinking it's a female lion tracks and we all of a sudden bump into, uh, bump into the Anderson male. So yeah, he was quite a big male, good genes. So how clear the mountains are today after all the rain. So there's much less vapor in the air at the moment. And therefore the mountains are very, very clear today. How pretty is that? Take that on the chin, Cape Town. Cape Town might have Table Mountain, but we have Marip's Corp. And a subsequent town underneath that mountain. Nah. A lot of people say that Lowfeld is the poor man's version of the Cape. The Cape is for those who can't handle it. They all run to the Cape. <laughs> Shots fired. Nah, no, I'm joking. I love the Cape. I actually do go down there quite a lot and I'll go and live there any day. <laughs> nah. I'm actually thinking to in fact, sort of like be like a swallow. I'll spend my winters up here and my summers down there. <laughs> I'm seriously considered, I'm not joking. I would have spent, uh, you know, I'm saying those who can't make it, I think I might be one of them. I think after 22 years of this inferno up here, I think I, I'm due to spend summers down in a milder area along the beach. Maybe, you never know. Might be able to achieve that someday. So now we know where Shadulu is. She's settled down, Tavankumi settled down. They're quite far apart now. We're in the northern section of Aubrey's and she's near Impala Plains. I really wish she would move her cups over here. You never know. The pressure in the west could get too much and she may move them over. Shadulu was really a sort of firm fixture here for a while. And she started to push almost towards Treehouse Dam, found on Twin Dams Road, way east of quarantine in the drainage line. But then she tended to, or she sort of retreated back west a little bit. But she knows this area, she knows this property, and it would be so lovely if she brought the little ones here. Or maybe I'm just wishful thinking. Shadulu's had not had 
too much luck raising offspring since Kara. You know Kara, don't you, Tabangumi? Mm, that's a yes. actually look quite comfy down there. It's so amazing to think of all the sort of receptors that we have in our body that we're not even aware of. Pain receptors that we don't think about. We experience pain, of course we do, but we don't think about all those sort of neurons that are detecting the stimuli. Even taste receptors. All over our sort of internal organs we have receptors. We have sweet receptors in the gut. And they are in sort of sweet receptors in our gut that control appetite. Bitter receptors in your lungs that actually recognize the presence of allergens and then trigger a response. All sorts of receptors that we never think about. Sorry, FC, I'll need to go one more time with that one. AFC, I don't have signal. If you could just repeat that comment one more time. We will leave sleeping Tavangumi soon. I want to just see if there's anything happening on quarantine, but we've been lucky here. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Look at his big shoulder blade there. Huge scapula. It looks really big when you see it like this. Hoisting power right there. But I wish I could sleep like Tom and Gumi too. I didn't have a good sleep last night. I don't know what it was. I think it's annoying your alarm's gonna go off at 4 a.m. and worried that you're gonna miss it. <laughs> We've all done that in camp. We've all had to wake each other up. Not often, but I do remember waking up James sometimes, Steve, I mean, Tristan. Always Darby. <laughs> but yes, I wish I could sleep like Tom and Gumi. Okay, we are going to leave Taban Gumi now, but what a morning. I just want to explore a little bit before drive ends, but for now, we're going to send you guys back over to Shudulu. Yes, uh, still here with uh, this beautiful leopardess known as uh, Shudulu, and she is still pretty much resting up on a marula tree, and loving the nice cool breeze that's running past her there it is quite a warm morning here at juma private game reserve if you have just joined us 
Thank you for joining us on our Sunrise Safari and Wild Earth. It has been a spectacular morning so far with sightings. As you can see, we have gone sitting here with a, a beautiful leopardess, or Shudulu, and uh, she is just resting nicely in this marula tree. And I know that uh, well, Lauren had a Tavangumi as well this morning, and he's also pretty much sleeping, I think, a little bit further north from where we are closer to a place on Vuyotela Axis, one of our main roads coming into Juma. And she had her Tavangumi for the morning. And of course, uh, Chris and Ben have been doing a lot of birding all over the show up at Pridelands and Matikwe. So yes, it's been a fantastic morning and uh, I'm glad that you have joined us. My name is Cedric Dold. I am the naturalist on Sparky this morning. And behind the camera, we've got old Panda. And we are enjoying this moment with this beautiful female and if you do not know this female uh, Shudulu she is now seven, eight, she's about eight years old she's coming on to eight years old and uh, still uh, well, she's in a prime and uh, she has got two cubs at the moment but of course the the cubs is uh, not around here on Najuma itself the cubs are still very small they're around about four four and a half weeks old so she will kind of leave them somewhere at a den site and then she will go out hunting and making sure that she can feed enough so she can produce some milk and then I'm sure she will head back. What do you hear, girl? What's happening behind us? Yeah, something that side. Hmm. Of course, nice, nice viewpoint. She's got such a nice uh, vantage point up in this marula tree. She can see so much more than what we can see. So. But I'm going to ask Panda, maybe if you want to go onto a belly there, you can see this beautiful kind of a bronze marking there. You can see the little suckle marks there with a the teat that's exposed. There it is. So you can see that she's got little cubs that's been suckling from it. So it ends up with that little kind of a bronze, a dirty marking around the teat area. And Marie, yes, definitely. <coughs> Thank you so much. Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat there. Um, yes, to see the Anderson male was quite a privilege. It was he was a beautiful boy. We got to see him quite often because um, his boundary. When I was working at Arethusa, he used to always use one of the use always the uh, one of the roads that uh, came on the western side of Arethusa. But yeah, as you can see, it is a, a live and interactive show. So if you've got any questions and comments, please send them through to us. I'm hoping that we can answer as much as possible. Oh yes, and for, on top of that, if you've just joined us, I forgot about it. We also we found the Talamati breakaway lions. Uh, of course, are three females, are three female lionesses, and of course, there are five youngsters on a road called the Nialis South. That's further east in our property, quite far in the middle. So yes, nice to find them, but they were very sleepy this morning. But yes, Anne-Marie talking about Anderson as well. Um, got to, and he was beautiful. He was so, so light. He, if you remember, there's a male called Mvula. Um, Mvula had that same kind of... Uh, they, just the, the complexion was very light. Not many spots on their face. Oh, look, they had the normal leopard spots on their face. But it wasn't like, you know, very compact. So it was very kind of widespread, those, kind of those spots. So it gave them more of a, like a lighter look. And I mean, the Anderson male was, he was, uh, he was a beast. He was huge. Big boy, that. And of course, her uh, mother is the Ingrid uh, Dam female. The Ingrid Dam female, I did not get to see her mother. Her mother was, her territory was in a property called Londolosi, further south. And um, yeah, and that's where, of course, Shudulu was born in Londolosi. And she came all the way up this side to set up a nice territory. So her territory is pretty much where, if you remember, female known as Shadow. Shadow used to have um, uh, exactly the same area as Shudulu is holding now, pretty much on the western side of the Juma property and, of course, heading into uh, the western area of Arethusa Safari and Simbambili, into those places. So that's exactly should do this territory. Did you know that explorers are watching ad-free right now? 
right this very minute they are listening to the soothing sounds of nature and seeing uninterrupted content. I am shaking with excitement. But don't fret, you can try out an Explorer subscription in monthly, six monthly and yearly options. Experience nature naturally, totally ad free. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Desert of zebra and a giraffe starting to come down. Very scenic. Look at that. What a view. Yep, no, she did. We're still enjoying this uh, treetops. Still enjoying the good old marula tree. It looks so comfortable up there. I'm getting quite jealous. She's in the shade, and old Panda and myself, we are sitting directly in the sun. And this, uh, this morning, well, the sun is sharp and it's hot. So I think today it's going to be quite a warm one. But yes, as you know, we've got uh, this user-generated content that we are looking for. So we are looking for all the unique jaw-dropping, uh, jaw maybe beautiful wild animal sightings from all of you, all of our viewers, to use all across the Wild Earth platforms. And in return, you can as well earn money and win prizes. As well as you can see your names on the credits on the Wild Earth TV shows. So please, all the viewers, you can go to our website, that is wildearth.tv and you can just click on the button, the content creator button, to find out all about the user generated content. So, yep, send us all those interesting sightings, please. It'll be great. You know that the wildlife always always gives us something different and something unique and uh, it's always nice just to get to see those moments and film it. And 
I must have always keep my eyes open for that. Kabuki, yes, so not definitely. Sh Shudulu is very dainty. She is a female. She's she's got that uh, nice, uh, how can I say, a dainty look about her. And that's all females. I mean, females are like half the size of a male. So you know, they're very petite. Well, of course, a male's big head, thick neck, big shoulders, big body. Uh, males are quite large, and I know Tavangumi. He is definitely growing into becoming a quite a big male leopard and quite a stunner as well. So yes, very nice that uh, Lauren, glad to have Lauren and David back again. And what a start for Lauren having old uh, Tawangumi this morning. I think that is definitely a great way to start your drives. But yeah, should do, I think I should do so I will say maybe a good, maybe around about 40, 45 kilograms. The way I've seen her before and walking. A nice little bit of a dewlap that's running at the bottom of her neck. But of course the males, they'll have that huge dewlap with that skin that's hanging. And uh, it's always nice just to see those big boys. But I did have Mulawati's tracks as well this morning. Unfortunately, it seems like Mulawati was at Gary Dam last night. Uh, it's a big male leopard that we do have here on Juma. And he went directly north towards uh, Biffleshook, another property. So, and he is quite a big male. He's our largest male in the area. JP, my favorite sighting of the Anderson male. Yo, JP, no, you, I have to dig deep here. Um, I mean, I could not even, I couldn't even remember when last I saw Shadulu, and that was just about a week ago. So now I have to think back eight years ago. This was 2015, 2016. Um, JP, I'm trying to think. Look, I, I had fantastic sightings with him moving in, um, I don't know what's that drainage line now on Arethusa. So I'm thinking that the and uh, I didn't see him making any kills or anything like that. Like no, nothing was like spectacular. Um, I think I did get to see him with Shadow. See, I'm I'm just scared. I'm actually gonna put the wrong sighting, or wrong or wrong leopards at the wrong sighting. Yeah, because now I have to really put it across. Look, we got to see him, but I mean, it was very sometimes very quick. He would come in move towards the northern side of uh, Arethusa Safari and would go straight down south again into Londolozi. He spent most of his time in Londolozi, that's the thing. Um, I just know that my my funniest sighting with him was when my tracker, I mean I had a tracker, and his name was Norman and he was my tracker for 10 years and uh, we still found his tracks on one of the roads on the cut line of Elephant Plains and Arethusa going north. And my tracker still told me, it's like, you know, it must be one of the Chalala lions that's maybe broken away and heading up north up this cut line. So we thought, okay, well, you know, there's lion tracks on the road. We followed, called in and, you know, told uh, the rest of this, uh, the vehicles around the area. You know, we've got lion, one female lion track going up, going north, we're following up. And uh, it wasn't long after that we actually realized uh, we bumped into Anderson and it was his tracks. So that's how big his tracks were. It was, it was a proper size. It was really, he had large, large feet. And um, yeah, we found him. So yeah, it was quite embarrassing. Well, I think more so for my track at that time. <laughs> But yeah, other than that, JP, I'm struggling to really get a, 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 a good a good sighting with the Anderson Mail. If I do remember one, I'll definitely let you know. It's like a dream. The more than harder, the, the harder you think about your dream, the further that story goes away and disappears.
we are just work, watching a work of art, really, when you think about it. Dung beetles very hard at work. And although it might seem a little bit gross at first, because it is dung at the end of the day, it's still really awesome to see what they're doing. It's also awesome to sit and watch, especially elephant dung, how quickly they arrive. They arrive very fast, you can actually time it, and they're using their chemoreceptors to smell for fresh dung in the area, the fresher the better. It's no easy task, you've got to break it down, squish it all into a ball if you are one of the ball rollers, and then move your ball with your hind legs. Oh, another one on side. watching this I think it's so incredible and when you fully understand the importance of dung beetles it makes us even more special ecosystem engineers harder work Just incredible. I could sit and watch these guys all day. I'm sitting in this block here with uh, Shadulu at the moment. Uh, this is exactly where we followed Tortoise Pan. Uh, maybe about three days ago, four days ago. We followed Tortoise Pan through this block exactly here. And he went. It went from the southern side to the northern side of this block. And this this block is not pretty. It's very thick. It's very. It's got a lot of this monkey orange uh, bushes, which pretty much rips out all the cables that's underneath the vehicle. So you got to really watch out in this this area. It's not the easiest of places. Does she want to come down? She's definitely aware of something. Sorry, I'm just taking a look here. She keeps on looking around. Of course. Impala Plains is just exactly west of us now. Maybe she sees some impalas there. Maybe she wants another meal. But uh, you know, leopards are very opportunistic. So if there is something walking past her, she'll definitely take a firm and keen interest in that prey species. Hey, mommy Shudulu. Mommy dearest. So nice. So she had four litters all overall. She's had four litters. So this is a fifth litter now that she's now got. So as I say, out of the four litters, unfortunately, she has uh, lost m all most cubs, but just, yeah, she was successful with one, and that is a female called Cora, and that was from her first litter. So she was a successful mom on her first first go. And unfortunately, the other three times. Um, it seemed like the cubs disappeared somewhere or another. And well, look, you know, for for leopard cubs reaching the age of two years old, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a it's not a huge percent. It's very low. So it's only about well, give and take twenty percent. And it just it depends on each individual. I mean, if you looked at Karula, Karula that used to be on Juma, I mean, her success rate as a mom. I was up to about 95. I think she only lost, she lost one cub while she was really around, and uh, out of what six litters, 
So she was very successful. So it just depends on that area and how many drainage lines have you got, how good is your den sites, and that kind of stuff. There's a lot of factors to it. So it's not saying that she's a bad mom at all, not at all. I mean, she definitely, she's, she's a fantastic mom. But it's just, yeah, there is other predators around, snakes, pythons, things like that. There's a lot of other, um, I can say, there's a lot of danger around for any kind of cub that's left alone at those den sites. But yes, like Lauren says, I also fully agree. I'm hoping that she, that we get to see her two little fur balls very soon. I'm hoping that she brings them onto Juma. And that's, you know, she, from about six, seven weeks, once she's, uh, they get about six, seven weeks, you'll find as she makes a kill this side, uh, she'll bring them this side then. Uh, it'll be very nice to see them coming here. And uh, it'll be great just to see them. Uh, Benjamin, yeah, she's got beautiful spots. So one thing you can, uh, uh, I mean, look at the bottom of her tail, beautiful, even the rosettes stretching all pretty much halfway down her tail. And uh, she's got beautiful rosettes all around her. And one thing about Shadulu, and you can identify Shadulu, is that right ear of hers. If you look at the right ear, she's got two little notches out of the right ear. If she actually looks at us, you'll see very quickly. And that is her one way to identify this uh, female. You can see there, uh, a notch right on top and a notch on the side that's been taken out. Not too sure how, I mean, sometimes walking, walking through the bushes and of course getting snagged on bushes and all that so, yeah. but yes if you want to see all our amazing best bits on our sun uh, sunrise safari this morning please make sure that you do download a wild earth app and uh, then you can go and take a look at all our best bits in the highlight reel it is definitely been a magical morning once again on wild earth got some great sightings and I'm hoping we can do it once again this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, Riley, you're welcome. It is always, I was, uh, uh, this morning, the three hours this morning felt like, honestly, it felt like half an hour because there was so much happening, so much excitement, so, so many things to see and just being out here in the, in the wilderness and watching these beautiful animals all around. It makes, uh, it makes the day or makes the drive go so quick <laughs> very very quick so yeah but thank you so much for joining us on on our, of course, our safari this morning and thank you so much for all the great questions and comments that you have sent through to us we do appreciate it as always keeps us on our toes keeps us going and also keeps us thinking so yeah thank you so much and make sure that you join us again on our sunrise, uh, sunset safari, not sunrise, but the sunset safari uh, this afternoon, but as well as right after our sunrise safari. So stay tuned as, of course, escape to nature.